<clears throat> well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, the dilemma we have on the floor at the moment with regard to the NDAA, which is passed every year for 60 straight years, is the majority leader has been reluctant to enter into an agreement for a reasonable number of amendments related to the subject. This is still <clears throat> being discussed, and I'm hoping we'll find a way forward. But really, this is must-pass legislation. Came out of committee 23 to 3. With all kinds of challenges related to the Russian pipeline, and to Russians threatening Ukraine. Uh, these issues need to be addressed in a normal amendment process. And that is the only reason that we push the pause button on this bill, <coughs> excuse me, yesterday uh, because of the absence of an agreement to go forward. That's still under discussion. You might have noticed that the chairman of the Fed said <coughs> the use of the word transitory in front of inflation should be discontinued, meaning obviously inflation is not transitory, it's going forward. The principal driver of that inflation is the American Rescue Package passed on a totally partisan basis earlier this year. The only way to keep inflation from getting worse would be to kill the reckless tax and spending spree, and we hope that's the ultimate fate for that ill-advised proposal. When the Democrats were uh, passing their first partisan spending bill back in February, I, I warned at the time that this was going to lead to uh, inflation. And um, obviously, we, we have inflation, the biggest inflation now literally in over 30 years, uh, impacting the pocketbook of uh, every American. Um, and as the Democrats now contemplate yet another tax and spending spree, that would recklessly and radically uh, try to transform and change our, our government and our country, but um, just as importantly, perhaps more importantly to the average American, is going to lead to further inflation, as the leader mentioned. And if you look at the, 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 the dimensions of this thing that's, that's being talked about, uh, the Democrats are talking about spending, you know, on the order of a couple trillion dollars financed with uh, uh, 1.5 or 1.8 trillion dollars in tax cuts or tax increases, I should say. But if you look at what independent analysts have come up with, Penn Wharton is a very reliable model on this. Uh, the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget has also looked at it. Both have concluded that when fully implemented, if these programs are extended, and we believe that is the intention of the Democrats, is to get them embedded and then to make them permanent, um, the 10-year cost of this is on the order of $5 trillion, which would leave you about $3 trillion of debt. You'd be adding it to the debt. And the individual components of this bill are awful. And you all have heard and seen uh, many of the provisions, but you know, we pay a lot of attention to agriculture in my state. There are a couple of provisions in there. One that adds a couple hundred million dollars for urban agriculture. Not sure what uh, that means, urban agriculture. There's over three billion dollars in the bill for tree equity. Evidently, we need more balance among the trees that are planted out there. I don't know. But this stuff is just crazy. And if you look at what the impact of the lifting the, the cap on deductibility of state and local taxes would be and how that would affect states around this country, you would have states like South Dakota, uh, states in the middle of the country that are low tax states subsidizing high tax states like New York and Connecticut and California and delivering tax cuts they're raising taxes in the bill, but cutting taxes for millionaires in people in states like California, Connecticut, and, uh, and New York. So this is just fraught with lots of problems. The American people recognize that, which is why they're turning on it so quickly, and why the Democrats are so desperately trying to pass it before the Christmas holiday. They know that as this thing is exposed to the public, that they're going to start losing more and more of their members. And what I would say is all it takes is one Democrat. One Democrat can stop this in its tracks and prevent this big government socialist idea from ever uh, becoming law. I hope that we'll have uh, a brave Democrat or two who will step forward and do just that because they will be doing a huge favor to the American people who are going to pay the price and the cost 
of this reckless, radical tax and spending spree. Thanksgiving weekend is the time that uh, many people hit the road. It's the most traveled weekend of the year, and thanks to Joe Biden and the Democrats this year, it was also the most expensive. And as people were hitting the road, gas prices were hitting the roof. Prices are up all across the country. And Joe Biden pretended to deal with this by announcing he was going to release some energy from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. Well, why, the reason I say pretending is the amount he released was just a drop in the bucket. It's about the amount that the United States uses every two and a half days. This is clearly no substitute for American oil and energy production. President Biden has declared war on American energy, and he started the first day in the White House when he drew a target on the back of American energy and he pulled the trigger. He killed the Keystone XL pipeline. He put a moratorium on leasing uh, for oil and gas on federal lands. And as a result, energy prices have gone way up. And I think it explains a lot about why the president's poll numbers have continued to go way down. It's the inflation. It's the cost of gas and groceries, totally a result of the actions of this administration. <clears throat> And this release of energy from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve by Joe Biden is putting a Band-Aid over the bullet hole when he's the guy that pulled the trigger. The Strategic Petroleum Reserve is for cases of emergency. We used it during the Iraq War. We used it during Hurricane Katrina. It's not there to cover over disastrous policies by this administration. Today in America, we're using more oil from Russia than we are from Alaska. This is a jackpot for Vladimir Putin. It's spend, sending lots of American dollars to Putin, and the President continues to beg Putin and OPEC to produce more energy. We have it here, we have it in the ground, and I would tell the President that the environmental standards in the United States are a lot better than they are where you're demanding that the energy be produced. And then during the slow news day of Friday, the Department of Interior announced that they want to make it even more expensive to produce American energy with uh, a notice that they want to raise the cost on oil and gas leasing on public lands. You know, there ought to be a law that if uh, they want to release energy from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve because of high costs, that they ought to also produce more energy in America, and I'm introducing that legislation this week. Well, there are 10.4 million uh, jobs that are open, uh, and mandate politics, I think, could wind up with a lot more jobs that are open. I'm continuing to hear from Missouri facilities that take care of veterans, or particularly our smaller hospitals, where just, frankly, people don't want to be told what they have to do about their own health. Now, I'm pro-vaccine, it's possible to be pro-vaccine and anti-mandate because the mandate, whether it comes from CMS at, at the Department of Health and Human Services or OSHA, as if really OSHA has ever thought before they could mandate particular types of health care, is a mandate that's going to produce more job openings and less ability uh, to fill s shelves in grocery stores or deliver things around the country or to take care of people at hospitals. I've talked to several Missouri hospitals who just simply believe that they can't stay open if they tell the people that do the work in the hospital, professional or not, that they everyone have to have a mandate or lose their jobs. When people lose their jobs, the country loses the services and benefits of those jobs. Uh, there is no reason to believe that a government that the government has the authority to tell people what they have to do about their own health care, particularly when the news continues to change about health care. I was just reading this week, there's now a widespread belief uh, that immunity from having COVID is as strong as immunity from the vaccine. Now, my personal view would be immunity from having both the vaccine if you had COVID is even better immunity, but that's not necessarily the decision of the government to make. It's a decision that people are more and more obviously insisting they make that decision for themselves. And if it means they have to leave their job, a lot of them are going to decide to leave their job. 
Welcome back, everyone. I do hope that everyone was able to enjoy Thanksgiving with their family and friends. And of course, over this holiday, Iowans had a lot of somber discussion over that Thanksgiving turkey about the crises that we have seen so far this year in this administration. Things like inflation and how it has impacted their pocketbooks, the open border situation uh, on the southern border, and of course uh, our loss of global standing in the eyes of our allies and friends around the world. And Iowans really want solutions for these issues. And what I can tell you is that it is not a solution for inflation when you spend trillions of dollars more. It is not a solution for a crisis at our southern border when you're promising amnesty to people who illegally cross the border and offer them benefits that our citizens receive. That's not a solution. And it is not a solution to our loss of leadership around the world to abdicate authority to a powerful Russia as they're preparing to invade Ukraine and to give up on Taiwan as the, they see China exerting pressure over them. These are not solutions. Americans want to see our federal government spending less. They want to see us close the border to illegal entrants. And they want to see us regain authority on a global stage. Those are solutions. And unfortunately, we are not seeing them from this administration. Across Florida, sheriffs are telling us that there's an unbelievable amount of fentanyl coming into the country. I went down to uh, the Yuma, the Arizona border in Yuma uh, last week, and what you saw is just people streaming across. So the Border Patrol sits there, people stream across, drugs are coming across. With the individuals, the Border Patrol is re responsible for picking them up. They do, they do the best they can every day, and they are dispersed around the country. They're not, you know, we, don't, we have no idea who these people are. The way it works is all you have to do is fly into Mexico, get to the border, walk across the border. Every family I talked to, and I talked to five families in about an hour, and they said, that's all we did. We just flew into, we flew into Mexico City, we flew here. There was a bus, brought us out here, and we walked across the border. This fentanyl is killing unbelievable amounts of people. We had 100,000, 100,000 people die of drug overdoses last year in this country. That's about one out of every 3,000 people live in this country died of a drug overdose last year. And the Biden administration doesn't care. With regard to this reckless spending bill, here's the latest. They want to give tax breaks to the wealthy in California, New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut, and in 12 states, cut the Medicaid program. Cut the Medicaid program for, for hospitals and other programs that take care of the poorest people in this country. You can't make this stuff up. Leader McConnell. Chair. Thank you. It was said to me said earlier that there were quote, talks going on about the debt ceiling. Have you had more conversations with your staff, with Leader Schumer, about how to address this? How has this progressed from you suggesting that there was an engagement uh, just before Thanksgiving? Yeah, first let, let me assure everyone the government will not default as it never has. And second, um, the Majority Leader and I have been having discussions about the way forward. But you wrote to President Biden back in the last, after the last debt ceiling that they would not, you not provide any assistance going forward. So why are you now providing assistance and what kind of assistance are you going to provide the Democrats to raise the debt ceiling? Yeah, we're having useful discussions about the way forward. Yeah. Um, listening to you and Senator Thune talk about inflation and Senator Thune talking about one brave Democrat who could stop this bill, I can't help but think you have a specific audience in mind. <laughs> have you discussed your views on the inflationary impact of this bill with Senator Manchin? Look, I think we all know the, the situation we're in. Not a single Republican in the Senate is going to vote for this reckless tax and spending spree. We, we all know it only would take one Democrat to tank it. Um, most of us feel that the single best thing we could do to fight inflation right now would be to kill this bill. And only one Democrat could do that. Are we hopeful that one will step forward? Absolutely. 
Yeah. Yeah. Uh, as you know, uh, they're still negotiating with respect to the CR. Are you confident that the government won't shut down by the end of the week? Yeah, we, we won't shut down. Um, Senator Shelby is engaged in discussions about the not only how long the CR should last, but certain conditions, um, sort of bright lines that we've had in these measures forever. Uh, for example, the Hyde, the Hyde Amendment. And um, I think we'll get there, and certainly <coughs> nobody should be concerned about a government shutdown. Uh, following up on the earlier question, you did meet again today with, with Senator Manchin. Can you just give us any indication? How, how are your talks that been going? Do you think you're having any effect on his views on Build Back Better? Well, as you all know, Senator Manchin loves to, to talk to everybody. He talks to you. He talks to us. We had a great discussion. I enjoy it. Uh, Joe's uh, company. Our states are pretty similar, and we both, I think, view part of our responsibility is to look after what most people refer to as flower country. And there's no question that the, today's Democratic Party in Washington is oriented toward the high population coastal areas of the country. So I admire uh, Senator Manchin. I think he's in a really challenging position in a party that is dominated by sort of East Coast elitism views of what America ought to look like. I pull for him every day, pray for him every night. Mm -hmm. <laughs>